Good afternoon. We're about ready to begin Lesson 50, and we're going to be talking about Satan's subtle attacks. Of course, uh, the first attacks were persecution set in on the church, and it was first the Jews persecuting, and later it was the Romans persecuting. But uh, what we're going to start seeing is some very subtle attacks, and I will now uh, get started with this lesson, but let's pray first and ask God to anoint it. We love you. We praise you. You're Almighty God. We thank you for your presence. Being with us, helping us, teach us, guide us, show us the way, Lord. We can't make it without you. We're asking your name. Give us the wisdom, the understanding that we need to be able to reach out for others and help us to share your word with others, share these lessons with others. We thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. With that, I'm going to get right into this lesson. Of course, each time I go back and I kind of highlight a few things out of our last lesson. And we had talked about <clears throat> the early church was ablaze. It was 123,000 cities came in, groups of priests. It was uh, moving along at such a rapid speed. People were spreading the word. They were sharing with others. And they were going from house to house, uh, reaching for people. The importance of the book of Acts is the fact that our church today should be the same kind of church, doing the same things, uh, the same doctrine. And as we're going through these lessons, we've got to see, are we truly the true church? Or maybe uh, our church has left something out. Maybe our church is uh, going down a wrong path somewhere. With this lesson, I'm hoping that we can all see that we've got to have a strong understanding of the book of Acts to make sure that each and every one of us are on the right road. And of course, we started out in chapter 1. Uh, everybody, there was 120, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, the 12 apostles, and, and there was others that were ready and waiting for the Holy Ghost. Jesus had told them to go to Jerusalem and wait and they were in the upper room, and on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, the Holy Ghost fell on each and every one of them, and they all began to speak in another language. They spoke in tongues. This is important because the speaking in tongues is the initial evidence that you've received the Holy Ghost. A lot of people uh, get this gift, which is Dorea, D-O-R-E-A, mixed up with the gift of speaking in tongue that's in the book of Corinthians that's uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, which is charisma, a whole different gift. And it's used in the church where this gift can be used outside the church. And it's the evidence that Jesus gave us that we have truly received his spirit. Uh, it takes a lot of faith because you've got to uh, believe his word in order to even say, Lord, Help me to receive your spirit. Uh, you've got to ask him for it, and you've got to show him that you're desperate for it, that uh, this is important to you. You've got to surrender your life to him. Uh, not my will, but thine be done. You've got to humble yourself before him. All these things, these are just some of the things we have to do to be able to accept his truth and to be a part of his church that started on the day of Pentecost. So we start here, the lame man in Acts 3, 1. <clears throat> it says, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And of course, from this, we find out that this is what started the persecution of the church. And we asked the question, has the devil been uh, uh, successful in the fact that as soon as this happened, the priests, the Sadducees, Pharisees all went against Peter and John, they said, never use this again. That's where the persecution started. Was the devil successful? For a lot of people, he was, because a lot of people have stopped using the name of Jesus in baptism. Jesus says we've got to use the name. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 is just one of the scriptures. It says, uh, go ye therefore in all the nations, baptizing in the name, in the name, Jesus. Uh, uh, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. A lot of people uh, repeat the command instead of doing what it says. 
They don't baptize in name. We've got to get his name on us because we become his bride. We've got to get the name. We become a part of his body. <laughs> if his name is Jesus, we better have Jesus on us. Uh, and his building, his tabernacle, his temple. Uh, we've got to have his name. And of course, many today, uh, because many religions preach against being baptized in Jesus' name, they use a doctrine that came, it was actually a false doctrine that came out of the Trinity. And uh, basically the Trinity doctrine, which was started by the Catholic Church, basically says there are three divine persons in one God. Wait a minute. Three divine persons in one God. Uh, Father is a spirit and Holy Ghost is a spirit. Jesus is the only one that... Uh, Jesus is the body. There's only one person. Uh, the very concept of Trinity is wrong because Jesus is God. The entirety of the Spirit is with Him. God, in order to uh, save mankind, He had to get, make a body for Himself so that He could go to the cross and die and shed His blood for all mankind. Without their shedding of blood, there's no remission. So, again, we're thankful what, for what Jesus did, what God did for us. Uh, humbled himself to come down this earth, make a body for himself so that uh, we could be reached. Talk about grace. Talk about mercy. Now, we're looking here at uh, the first uh, martyr was Stephen. He was stoned, and, of course, Paul is standing in background ground with his arms folded and and he's noting I should say Saul at that time later became Paul but Saul is noting all, all the things that were happening here how Steve his face looks like an angel and he, he says forgive them Lord that uh, do this uh, hold this not against them and just imagine what was going through his mind and of course when Steve looked up he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And a lot of people were confused by this. They're saying, see, he saw Jesus and he saw God. No, he did not. God is a spirit. Uh, John, uh, let me see. God is a spirit and they to worship him must be worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. You cannot see a spirit. God cannot be seen. God is invisible. Why did he make a body for himself so that he would have a visible, uh, he, his uh, essence could be seen in Jesus Christ. And so what did they actually see? Right hand to the Jews was always God's power and authority. Still the same with us. Uh, if you have someone on your right hand, he's the person or she's the person that's doing the main work for you. Uh, your right hand's doing the work. When Jesus was standing there before him, uh, <laughs> he was able to see that he was, the glory of God was all around him. Jesus was God, and he was the right hand of the Spirit, uh, which, again, the working body of the Spirit. What a, what <laughs> a fantastic thing for Stephen to see as he died and he was standing usually he's sitting at the right hand of God but here he was standing in honor of Stephen taking this martyr's death now of course we talked about James being killed by Herod which goes from the Jews killing to the uh, political the Herod uh, 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 the ruler in the Roman Empire doing the killing and of course Peter was imprisoned because uh, he wanted to kill him too, but the people prayed him out. But we start, the early church was blaze. It was growing rapidly, but persecution entered in when the uh, name of Jesus was used in chapter 3 to heal the lame man who had been lame all his life. Persecution begins because of the name of Jesus. It lasted 300 years until 312 A.D., the church uh, grew, uh, and it was. And this is in Acts eight four that uh, we're, we're kind of looking 
as Acts 3, 4, we're moving forward. But uh, each time we see the, the church kept growing through all this persecution. 312 AD is the Edict of Milan. It was handed down by Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, where he stopped persecution. This was not good. People think it was, but this gave him an opportunity to take over, the, especially the Church of Rome, become the head of that church, and to start changing the doctrines of the church. He was the first one that made a major change at the Council of Nicaea, where he, he developed the uh, Trinity doctrine. But I'm going to get to that later on. Let's keep moving forward with the book of Acts. Uh, persecution first was in Jerusalem, spread to uh, the other part, uttermost parts of the earth, Samaria, Caesarea, and Antioch. They were first called Christians, and then uttermost part of the earth. Rome uh, was severe persecution, and then the severe persecution came to Jerusalem. It says persecution in Jerusalem caused the church to be moved to Antioch. Uh, at Antioch, they were first called Christians. I wonder why they were first called Christians at Antioch. Uh, Paul was there at this time, and it had been something like 18 to 25 years uh, that he had been in, in hiding because not only were the Jews against him because he, he was a traitor, but the Christians were against him because he used to kill the Christians. So, uh, uh, we're looking at this. Why were they first called Christians? I'm going I'm to get to that in a minute because I'm trying to go through 8 and 9 and then we're going to get to chapters 11 and 13 that talk about the Church of Antioch. Uh, Acts 8, I went over that last week and basically uh, there was a lot of things happening in Acts 8 and we, we see people were healed, miracles and signs were taking place. No one received the Holy Ghost at this time. Uh, Acts 15 to 17, it says they believed. And then because of their belief, they were baptized. And it was, says that in verse 12 and 16. Later, when Peter got there, they received the Holy Ghost and spoke. Well, in Acts 8, it doesn't say that they spoke in tongues, but it's obvious that something mighty happening, happened because all the great things that happened at the beginning and now we have this Simon the Sorcerer coming along, want to buy the ability to lay hands on the people so they could receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, we have to say, what did he seek? Yeah, there, it was something that was not ordinary, and he knew that it was worth a lot because he saw people's lives change before him. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, we ended up, Acts 8, saying that uh, he was told to repent I want to buy the things of God, and to, to, uh, this was so wrong. But uh, we never see that Simon the sorcerer ever did repent. He never did turn around because he held the things of this world more important than the things of God. And he'd seen miracles and signs, but that wasn't enough for him. And he got baptized too, but uh, uh, he just did not receive the fullness of what God wanted to give him. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. First of all, we see that he was persecuting the true church. Uh, we saw him in the background with Stephen, and we saw the. We knew we know that this had to have a strong effect on him later on, or probably every night when he went to bed after that, seeing his face like an angel and seeing the way he died and how it, he was asking forgiveness just like Jesus did. Uh, of the people that were before him. And then on the road to Damascus, he was struck down to receive the Holy Ghost. He and all the other riders with him were uh, uh, a bright light show. Next thing, they were all uh, down on the ground and, and uh, God speaks to him. And what's interesting here is that uh, he says, who art thou? And the voice came back, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And with all this taking place, it was having a strong effect on uh, uh, Paul. And we see that he got to uh, Damascus. He was blind for three days. And God told uh, one of the men there, and I'm trying to uh, 
can't think of his name off the hand, but he, he said, go to him. And he prayed for Paul. After three days, the uh, scales on his eyes were removed. He could see again, and he received the Holy Ghost. And we know he spoke in tongues because in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about the fact that he says, I speak in tongues more than ye all. So we know he spoke in tongues, and uh, he got baptized too. And of course, he would have never got baptized in Jesus' name if he didn't go out and have people baptized in Jesus' name himself. Because he became a Christian, he was beaten many times, but he went to Antioch and he went on three missionary journeys from Antioch because when he got there, he said, this is what I've needed. At Antioch, he found out what he needed to teach and preach when he went off on each one of his missionary journeys and he came back to Antioch again. Uh, he was so impressed with what was happening there. Paul became an ambassador to the Gentiles. And when he got to Antioch, they were already witnessing to Gentiles. And of course, he ends up in prison and he wrote 14 epistles in the New Testament. Some will say 13, but I say 14 because Hebrews is the one that doesn't really have a direct answer, but the writing is so sim similar to everything else that he had done that most scholars say that uh, he wrote 14. He did write the book of Hebrews. And of course, he ends up, he was beheaded. Acts 10. <laughs> this is Peter yet. He had opened the doors to the uh, Jews, the Gentiles, and the uh, Samaritans. In Acts 8, the Samaritans. Here he opens the door to the Gentiles. This is a very important chapter. Cornelius, a devout man, feared God, prayed always, gave much alms. No matter what church you're in, what religion you're in, you could be the same person. Remember, God doesn't look at religions. Uh, he came into a room with Jews one time and he says, Now then I am here, you have no cloak for your sins. Meaning, uh, cloak is uh, your covering for your sins. And he was saying, your religion can't do you one bit of good. You've got to start following me. So here we're seeing... Cornelius was a devout man. He feared God. He prayed always, gave much. He was a good, good person. But because he sought, sought God, God had more for him and told him to contact Peter, who would tell him what to do. Uh, now, belief required. Uh, he, he had to receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, and they knew he had received the Holy Ghost because they heard him speak in tongues. That uh, Some will get baptized in Jesus' name and then receive the Holy Ghost. Some will receive the Holy Ghost and get baptized in Jesus' name. Here's an example of people receiving the Holy Ghost first and then getting baptized in Jesus' name. But in Acts 10, 47, 48, when they heard him speak in tongues, they commanded, uh, Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. So uh, Cornelius and all his house uh, became part of the church because they believed, they repented, they got baptized in Jesus' name, and they received the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. Acts 11. There was a discussion of this previous chapter, chapter 10, where uh, Paul, uh, Peter, and some of the Jews went with him to see what was going to happen here, and to talk with Cornelius and see him and his entire family coming into the church, being baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost with evidence of tongues. And, but they were discussing that. They were saying, uh, Jews, why, uh, we're Jews, and why should the Gentiles get this? So in the discussion, Peter tells what happened. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. He was talking about the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost fell. Everybody spoke in tongues. There was evidence of them receiving the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. Same thing happened in Acts 10 where Cornelius and his family as happened on the day of Pentecost. Then remember I the word of the Lord how that he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost for as much then as God had get, gave them the like gift as he did unto you and unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Get that, it says, for, mu 
For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. Doria, the gift of the Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking in tongues, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That requirement believing. If you believe, uh, uh, Mark 17, 16 says, they that believe, they shall receive, uh, they shall speak in tongues. It says, for they that believe, they shall speak in tongues. Very important scripture. What was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then God also t uh, to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. A church at Antioch, very important church. Let me read this for you, uh, starting with 11.22. The tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which, is, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent for Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of ho the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And, they, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were first called Christians, first in Antioch. Barnabas goes to Antioch, and he's saying, wow, i got to get Paul. He gets Paul in Tarsus, brings him back. And Paul was not an apostle. He was not a preacher, not a teacher. Um, at that time, he was just someone who had received the Holy Ghost, spoken tongues, was baptized in Jesus' name, but he had been in hiding all these years. But uh, now he comes here and he becomes a teacher at Antioch. And after a year, they were first called Christians. Has anybody ever called you a Christian? Think about that. They were first called Christians. This is about 18 to 25 years after the church started, and this is the first time that anybody was called a Christian? That's an interesting statement. A lot of people call themselves Christians these days. Are they really Christians? The, uh, what did uh, Barnabas and Paul see at Antioch? What impressed them? What caused them? Well, we, we can already see they were reading the Bible and they were being trained in the Bible and they were being taught in the Bible. And after a year, they were first called Christian. But there's, there's got to be something else here. And as we start reading down uh, Acts 11, 19 to 30, and chapter 13, which tells us all about the church of Antioch, we can see exactly what it is. We can see that besides reading and obeying the Bible, they prayed, they fasted, they were witnessing already to the Gentiles, and they were giving. In fact, uh, Paul and Barnabas took a love offering to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was going down. Everybody was being uh, trying to get to Antioch. And so they brought a love offering to help the people in Jerusalem to get out of Jerusalem and get to Antioch or to escape to any place that they could. So uh, again, we see here five basic things, praying, fasting, witnessing, giving, reading and obeying the Bible. Uh, that's what they were seeing in this church. And of course, when Paul saw this, he goes, wow, I can do it. And uh, he, this is where he started his missionary journeys. Uh, they uh, ordained him, they uh, blessed him, they laid hands on him. And he and Barnabas head out on the first couple of uh, missionary journeys. And the last one, uh, Barnabas went with Mark and Paul went with Silas on the third one, but they started in Antioch and always came back to Antioch. Uh, this word Christian, it's only used three times in the entire Bible. And it's usually used in some kind of a negative sense, like, are you a Christian? You're acting like a Christian. Well, what's important here is that uh, in our society today, we think if we go to a church that believes in Jesus, that we're Christians. Uh, not so. Uh, the definition of a Christian is someone who
who is doing exactly what Jesus would have done. Whoa. Uh, a lot of people in churches, all they've done is believed. They've never got baptized in Jesus' name. They've never received the Holy Ghost. They've never spoken tongues. They never, because they didn't receive the Holy Ghost, they aren't operating in any of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, many in churches today are being taught false doctrines. And, and you start looking at the, how could they ever be called a Christians? Well, they name themselves. They call themselves Christians. But the thing about the Bible is, is those that uh, were outside the church looked in at the church and they called them Christians. Hopefully someday someone will be able to call each and every one of us Christians. But we've got to be doing what they were doing in the book of Acts. Again, the book of Acts is so important because in the book of Acts, this is where we find out uh, what the church is to be like. Uh, I've shown this to you before, but I want to emphasize that the tabernacle, the church in the wilderness, sets up the basic things we have to do in the New Testament to live for God. See that table of shoe bread? That's reading and obeying the Bible. The altar of incense, praying and fasting. Candlestick, witnessing and giving. That's just the first level. The second level is, is the t table of shoe bread is communion. The altar of incense is relationship with God. And the candlestick is unity, relationship with others. The third level is miracle signs and wonders. The, uh, the table, the shoe bread, it's the, uh, how do I say that? The table set by God in the wilderness. But on that table is whatever you want. If it's healing, if it's miracles, if it's whatever you want, it's on that table. And, and that's what this table of shoe bread is all about. And then the altar of incense. This is one of the most important things we can do as a Christian, intercession. Intercession is where we're praying for others to be saved. Uh, Jesus, God in the Old Testament says, I wondered that there was no intercessors. And then the last thing down here is we've got to be conformed into his image. We've got to be holy because he is holy. He said, be holy as I am holy. That was a command. Without holiness, no man will see God. And if we do the things that, and, and that I've just talked about with this chart, uh, someday somebody may call us a Christian because we are conformed into his image. We're saying the, saying the things he would do. We're doing the things. We're going to the places. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Would Jesus do this? Would Jesus say that? Would Jesus think this? We've got to be just like him. Our goal in this world is to be conformed into his image. Our goal is to, to get to heaven. Because uh, if we, that's our goal, we might not get there. But if we, our goal is to be conformed into his image, we're going to do it. Thank you, Lord, for what you've showed us today. In your name, amen.